Uh, welcome to the seminar today. And today we have uh, Lawrence Eberhardt. Uh, we'll be talk talking about his very recent spectacular work on uh, quantizing 3D gravity as a as a we also wrote topological quantum field theory. Uh, so over to you, Lawrence. Now. All right. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation. And I'll be talking about a paper that I wrote recently with Scott Collier and Meng Yang Zhang. And hopefully at some point there will be also a second paper appearing. So let's start uh, by reviewing some um, kind of uh, vague lores that exist in 3D quantum gravity. And I should also say first that I always will be talking about 3D gravity with negative cosmological constant. So ADH3 gravity. And um, it has been a lot discussed in the literature that there is a relation between 3D gravity and two copies of SL2R churn Simon's theory. And uh, this relation is really a little bit vague. Um, in particular, neither of the two sides are understood. So we don't really understand what 3D gravity is. We don't understand what SL2R churn Simon's theory is. In particular, it has not been successfully quantized so far. And uh, we also don't understand the relation very well. And in particular, also this relation till now, um, I would say it was only of very limited use. And uh, in particular, you can't use either side to solve the other because the relation is not clear and both sides are not clear. And so instead, if we try to understand 3D quantum gravity, what we're usually doing is that there is a, some patchwork of different approaches. So um, for example, Maloney and Witten and John B. Maloney Yin, they computed some one loop determinants. And then there is some other fascinating Hamiltonian work. Um, but none of these approaches are entirely satisfactory. And in particular, we can't use them to compute, say, arbitrary uh, Euclidean partition functions. We can just compute them to um, use them to compute very special quantities or the one loop effects or things like that. And similarly, there should be a, some version of the ADS CFT correspondence that holds for this uh, 3D gravity. Um, but uh, there's a very huge number of partially conflicting proposals how this ADS-CFT correspondence should work. So, uh, and most of them are inspired by the recent progress in ADS-2, where we have, for example, um, dualities between JT gravity and ensemble of matrix um, models. And so the, the common lore is usually that the boundary CFT is some sort of uh, ensemble averaged um, CFT2. But uh, that's not what I will be talking about. Uh, in the talk, we will just talk about 3D gravity itself. And uh, hopefully in the future, this will be applicable to finding out what the boundary CFT actually is. So what we will more precisely do in this talk is to make this correspondence with SA2R and Simon's theory uh, precise. And this will in particular require that we slightly change SA2R and Simon's theory and instead of sl 2 and Simon's theory, we will make a correspondence to a different TQFT that we'll call the Verzor TQFT. Uh, this Verzor TQFT, it has sort of implicitly appeared already a couple of times in the literature. Uh, sometimes it has been called Teichmüller TQFT, in particular in these papers by Anderson and Kashev. These are two mathematicians. Uh, although I should mention that on a mathematical level, it is still conjectural that these two TQFTs are actually the same, since they have a very different definition of the TQFT than the one that we'll give. And uh, this Verizon TQFT will not be a completely standard TQFT, um, mostly because it will have a continuous spectrum of Wilson lines. So usually in a TQFT, there is some finite dimension Hilbert space, and there is some discrete number of Wilson lines. Here, the Hilbert space will be infinite dimensional and we will have an infinite number of distinct Wilson lines that are labeled by a continuous label. But uh, that sounds a little bit um, scary perhaps, but most of these difficulties can be overcome. That's what I will try to convince you today. In particular, the main uh, sort of outcome will be that we will have this relation between 3D gravity and Verzor TQFT or two copies of that. And it will be computationally very useful because we can actually compute things in the spheres over to QFT, such as the partition functions on some hyperbolic manifolds. Um, and that will lead to an efficient algorithm to compute 3D quantum gravity partition functions. And uh, so we'll still have this, we'll still have this restriction to hyperbolic three manifolds for technical reasons that uh, you will see later. 
All right, that's more or less the plan. Uh, perhaps I should also mention that feel free to interrupt me at any time since we are quite a small group and uh, we can have it quite informal, I think. Actually, then I have, yeah. I have to I have some questions already. Uh, so uh, maybe you're going to mention this in your talk later. So uh, the uh, so in this TQFT, is there a, a representation of a conformal transformation? So not all conformal transformation may be unitary representations, but are there? Uh, um, you, there will be a representation. Down? So the, the Hilbert space of this TQFT will carry a representation of the mapping class group. Um, if that's what you mean by a conformal transformation. So basically the large conformal transformations, like modular transformations and the torts and so forth. Or uh, cross yeah. transformations. Yeah, but I was having a, like a, some confusion here. I mean, this, because some of these things are, uh, cannot be have unitary, uh, not unitary operators. Like for example, uh, if you map it to so the this, cylinder, for, for example, and it will go. Yeah, so this, this TQFT will in fact be unitary because three gravity is a unitary theory. We're not doing non-unitary things. Um, yes. But uh, uh, yeah, may, maybe we'll, let's let's hold that thought maybe and let's yeah, discuss exactly. it again later if that's okay. Uh, okay. Because I think most of these things will be explained. Yes. All right. So then um, there will be roughly three parts of this talk. Uh, the first part will be entirely review. And we'll start by uh, reviewing the phase space of 3D quantum gravity and its structure. And then we'll quantize it. And the quantization will naturally lead us to this verso or TQFT. And um, that in particular will show that there's a relation between the two theories. And then in the third part, are, I'll try con to convince you that it's computationally useful by going through various simple examples and showing that you can very easily compute 3D gravity partition functions with this technique. All right, so let's start with the phase space. And um, so the classical uh, relation between 3D gravity and SL2 arch transcendence theory, so we'll paddle back for a moment and talk again about SL2 arch transcendence theory, uh, follows by just recognizing that if you describe 3D gravity in a first order formalism, then you can take linear combinations of the dry bind and the spin connection. And um, you need some dimension full constant here, which is the ADS length. If you take these linear combinations, then it becomes a sort of SL2R gauge field. So you can form these combinations, you get this A plus and A minus, and you can check that if you do coordinate transformations, so diffeomorphisms and local Lorentz transformations, then this A mu plus and minus transforms just like an SL2R gauge field. And what's more is that uh, you can write down the einstein hilbert action, and you can uh, check that under this field redefinition, it precises, precisely maps to the SL2R times SL2R to Simon's action. And the level um, is the same for both factors, or it's K and minus K, and K, K is related to the central charge of the boundary CFT. It's proportional to its boundary central charge, as was computed by Brown and Hennel. So that's the classical relation between 3D gravity and SL2R to Simon's theory. And it would make you perhaps think that these two theories are completely equivalent. But it's not completely true, basically because there are two there are two problems in this mapping, and uh, the first one is that in gra gravity we have an additional constraint on the metric. We want a metric that is everywhere, at least in Euclidean gravity. We want it to be everywhere positive definite, and uh, since we're doing Lorentzian gravity, we want it then to have the correct signature. There should be one minus direction, and the rest should be plus direction. And from the point of view of SL2 Arch and Simon's theory, there's no condition of that sort. The gauge field uh, that we took, but that we constructed by taking linear combinations of the dry band and the spin connection can be whatever you want. In particular, it can be zero, for example. So there are many gauge field configurations that look very sick from the point of view gra of gravity. And so we would like to consider something like SL2 Arch and Simon's theory, but then restrict the allowed field configuration somehow. And this is the problem that we'll argue will be resolved by considering Vera Zoro TQFT instead of SL2 Arch and Simon's theory. And this is a little bit of a win win situation because this Vera Zoro TQFT uh, is solving this problem, but it's also much better understood because we can actually solve it contrary to SL2 Arch and Simon's theory, which to this day, day still we don't really know how to quantize it. And so we will actually make the theory simpler. 
Okay, that's the first problem. And the second problem uh, in this translation between 3D gravity and SO2 Archenstein's theory has to do with global, uh, with the global structure of the gauge group. So in gravity, we have to gauge by all diffeomorphisms. And in particular, these diffeomorphisms also include large diffeomorphisms, which are the three-dimensional analogs of modular transformations. So in 2D, we know, most of us know this quite well. For example, if we do 2D gravity or string theory, then we need to integrate over all the metrics, but we need to mod out by the mapping class group, which is for the torus, for example, as the famous SL2Z transformations. And uh, similarly, if we do 3D quantum gravity, we have to mod out by this mapping class group. And formally, the mapping class group is the group of all diffeomorphisms modded out by the diffeomorphisms that are sort of small that you can continuously get from deforming uh, away from the identity. That gives you some discrete group. And typically for in 2D, this is, for example, this PSA2Z for the torus or SA2Z. And in gravity, uh, we would gauge that group. But if you go through the correspondence with this uh, SL2R gauge field, you would see that on the TQFT side, you would not gauge this group. And uh, so there's some small mismatch of the, of the gauge groups on both sides. And we'll see that for hyperbolic three manifolds, we can resolve this problem by hand. But this is still not entirely satisfactory to me, at least, because the correspondence needs you to uh, do something by hand that uh, doesn't come out automatically. Um, and related to this, there's also, of course, if you gauge the mapping class group, there is similarly something that you should sum over. And in gravity, we know that we should sum over different topologies, whereas in gauge theory, we would typically consider one topology and put our gauge theory on that topology. All right. But that is also simple to impose by hand. So now let's uh, discuss the phase space. And let's put our 3D gravity theory uh, on some spatial manifold. So we consider some spatial. Uh, I have a question. I have a question about the previous slide. Uh, so uh, sh why should we gauge the mapping class group in 3D uh, gravity? Isn't it, aren't these asymptotic uh, symmetries? Good. good. Uh, so let's just pretend for a moment that our manifold is a closed manifold. There is no oh, boundary. Okay. 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 Then so I think we can agree. Right. Yeah. Uh, yes. The way I wrote it down uh, is, is for a closed manifold. For an open manifold, uh, you have to be careful what you mean by mapping class group. Right. The mapping class group is the mapping class group that acts trivially, the set of diffeomorphisms that acts trivially on the boundary, but can do anything in the bulk. And you mod out by, by again, the same set that is connected to the identity. Ah, okay. okay. That's the okay. So that's something that has nothing to do with the asymptotic structure. But you're right that this will interact in an interesting way with the with the sort of boundary mapping class group. We'll see that later. Um, Lawrence, I have a question. Maybe yes. the, suppose we look into this limit where you know that uh, we have only classical gravity, uh, ADS3 mm -hmm. gravity. In that context, uh, this kind of uh, like we can think of a, like a solid torus uh, and then some of these large diffeomorphisms, some of them will uh, take for the vacuum to the BT, BTZ black hole, right? Uh, not quite. So you're thinking of mapping class group transformations on the boundary. On so the boundary. You, those, those are actually things you should sum over because those are inequivalent manifolds. If you so the the IDS uh, thermal IDS and the BTZ black hole, they're two different to considered to be two different bulk manifolds. What the bulk oh. mapping class group is doing. So you take a solid torus. What you can do is you can slice it open along a disk and you can twist the disk by two pi and you can re-glue it. Mm. So then you haven't changed your bulk manifold. So it is a diffeomorphism of the bulk manifold, but it's not continuously connected to the identity. Mm. And that's the thing that you should gauge in principle. So you, you were mentioning already a slightly more complicated example because that interacts non-trivially with the boundary. So th yes. those two things that you mentioned, they, they interact. So there's this boundary mapping class group that you should sum over, and there's the bulk mapping class group that you should divide by. And so in the end of the day, what you will sum over is a coset of the two groups. Oh, OK. This is where what I was asking initially. Yeah. So, OK, now I see. But uh, my confusion is that, uh, uh, I mean, usually these kind of uh, transformations lead to mixed states and uh, from CFT perspective. So that's right, yeah. Uh, I, I don't have a good answer to that. Uh, essentially, we'll just do whatever we would do in gravity. 
and I won't say anything about the boundary CFT um, since yeah. So this is this will be purely about understanding three yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right. So these are the two problems. Um, uh, so this problem is very famous in 2D. Maybe I should also mention in 2D if you compute partition functions say of JT gravity, then it's very important that we compute the volume of the modular space of Riemann surfaces, and we're not computing the volume of the Teichmüller space of Riemann surfaces, which is the universal cover of that. And modding out by the mapping class group is precisely what Mirzakani's recursion relation uh, solves. So in 2D, it's a very important issue also, and uh, pretty famous. Okay, so let's discuss it again the phase space and consider 3D gravity on some spatial manifold sigma, and let's try to impose some initial conditions there. And uh, from the point of view of chern simons theory, uh, this is very easy to do. So the chern simons phase space is just uh, to impose inertial condition of chern simons theory, you just have to specify your gauge uh, connection on the initial surface. And there is also Gauss law, which tells you that the, uh, the gauge bundle that you start with actually has to be flat. And so the chern simons phase, phase space just ends up to be this set of all flat SL2R times SL2R gauge. Uh, connections on the initial value surface up to gauge transformations. So in fancy terms, this is the modular space of flat SL2R times SL2R bundles. But uh, it turns out, and as was already mentioned before, not all of these flat bundles will be good initial conditions in gravity, since some of them are very singular. And so we only want to pick out uh, the part of this phase space that corresponds to smooth uh, gravity solutions. And the nice mathematical fact about this modular space of flat bundles is that it's actually disconnected space. More precisely, I should talk about PSL2R. But for PSL2R bundles, uh, this modular space is a disconnected space whose components are labeled by a certain uh, topological number. It's the Euler number of that bundle for the experts. Um, and one of these components is known as Teichmüller space. And Teichmüller space, uh, you can understand in various different ways. You can understand as being the, the space that parameterizes hyperbolic structures on a Riemann surface. So if you're given a Riemann surface uh, with a hyperbolic metric, such as some genus two surface, say, then you can look at its tangent bundle. It's a two-dimensional vector bundle, and it is actually flat as PSL2R bundle. So that means that some flat PSL2R bundles arise from specifying hyperbolic metrics on Riemann surfaces, but not all of them do. And only the ones in this special component um, of the flat SL2R bundles arise in this way. And another way to understand Teichmüller space that is perhaps more familiar is that it's the universal covering space of the moduli space of Riemann surfaces. So it's essentially the moduli space of Riemann surfaces that we encounter, say, in string theory or something. But we're not dividing by the by by the 2D mapping class group. So, for example, for the torus, this would just be the upper half plane. So we're not yet dividing by SL2Z. And um, yeah, for this sphere, it would be like the universal covering of a sphere with three points removed, um, which is the space that is described by the cross ratio on the sphere. But in any case, uh, we have this Teichmüller space, and the gauge fields in this Teichmüller space are precisely those that describes regular metrics. This is a non-trivial theorem because it is pretty trivial to see from the on the initial value slice, but you need to make sure that if you're in the subspace and you evolve your gravity solution, that it still remains regular, even the 3D gravity metric. But this turns out to be the case. So, but, uh, so the important conclusion that you should take away from this slide uh, is that the gravity phase space on sigma turns out to be Teichmüller space uh, squared. So one for the left movers, one for the right movers. And this is a particular subspace of the modular space of, um, of the phase space of sl 2 transcendence thing. And so this makes precise that subspace that we want to pick out uh, in order to only have regular metrics. Okay. So now it's actually pretty simple to quantize that phase space. As usual, in going to quantum theory, we need to quantize it to get our Hilbert space. And so in particular, if we want to understand the Hilbert space of 3D gravity, then we need to quantize Teichmüller space. And luckily this was already achieved in a series of papers by uh, Verlinde, Kashev, and Techner. And the main result uh, will be that quantization of Teichmüller space 
it gives you a Hilbert space, and that Hilbert space is the space of Liouville conformal blocks. So I should explain this in a little bit more detail. First of all, uh, let's recall what it means to quantize some abstract manifold. Tight mirror space is some syntactic manifold, as is every um, phase space. So when we quantize, we want to find some Hilbert space that is spanned by some wave functions. Those wave functions will be uh, functions of roughly half of the coordinates in our space. So for example, if we would quantize just a free particle on a line, then the phase space consists of the position and the momentum, and our wave function at the end of the day will be some function only on the position or only on the momentum. That's up to us. But in a similar way, the wave functions on Teichmüller uh, that we get from quantizing Teichmüller space will depend on half of the coordinates of Teichmüller space. And since Teichmüller space is a complex space, what that means in practice is that you can choose those half of the coordinates just to be holomorphic dependence on the coordinates. And that should slowly tell you that there's a connection to conformal blocks because conformal blocks do the same thing. So conformal blocks are holomorphic uh, solutions of some word identities and CFTs, and they're holomorphic functions on modular space, but they're not single valued, and that's their actually holomorphic function on the universal cover of modular space, namely Teichmüller space. Okay, and um, if you look more precisely, then if you quantize Teichmüller space, you should only get normalizable uh, Verrazoro conformal blocks. And that tells you that you should only get the conformal blocks that appear in Liouville theory, which are those that whose conformal weights are all bigger than the threshold conformal weight, which is C minus one over 24. Um, okay, we'll, we'll see that also more explicitly later on, but hopefully that statement makes sort of sense. And so the, the important conclusion is that the Hilbert space of 3D gravity turns out to be two copies of this uh, Hilbert space H sigma, which in turn is the space of all Liouville conformal blocks. All right, so this slide is just some uh, small reminder on how we usually parameterize uh, the central charges in Verizon representation theory. So it will come up a couple of times. So it's convenient to write the central charge as one plus six Q squared where Q is B plus B inverse. So we're just, instead of using this parameter C, we're mostly using this parameter B now. And we'll take B to be a real, which means that C needs to be bigger than 25. And um, we also have conformal Sorry. weights. That, so is that, this the right place to ask you about the normal, the inner product of the wave functions? Uh, um, not yet. If you could wait like two slides and then ask me again, because I'll explain it in two slides, if that's okay. Right. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, Sorry, right, could I have and a quick question. Yep. I mean, you started with the SL2R times SL2R theory, and then you sort of said you will, I mean, you've considered sort of some subset of configurations yep. and decided to quantize those. Yep. So, um, is it because the answer is nice that you feel this is the right thing to do? Because usually you wouldn't truncate like that and um, hope to find That's it. right. Yeah. Yeah. If you if you just quantize uh, some subset of a phase space, usually you get, you get complete complete uh, garbage. Sort of. Right. There's no guarantee that if you have some random phase space, that will lead to some some nice theory. And yeah. So so we will just following what you should do from the point of view of three D gravity. So right. this is really the phase space of three D gravity. That's uh, on a classical level. That's true. And so you might hope that if you quantize it, you get something nice. And indeed, you do. So okay. that's sort of the reason. But but you're absolutely right that if I if I would have picked any other of so there are these disconnected components. If I would pick any other components and I try to quantize, I get uh, nonsense. So, but didn't you argue that those are the precisely the space of invertible metrics? That's right. Yeah. But still, it's not guaranteed that if you have some phase space and uh, you quantize it, uh, you're not guaranteed that you'll get a consistent 3D gravity theory, uh, 3D, yeah. Yeah, field theory. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Right, uh, okay, yeah, so, so and yeah, finally, so we, we're just parameterizing uh, the central charges and conformal weights in the standard way. And so again, normalizability will mean that in this Liouville conformal block, we'll have that these uh, Liouville momenta p, uh, they they will be real for all the internal states. So that means that delta is bigger than this q squared over four, which in turn is c minus one over twenty four. 
And what we'll also need uh, is that um, at least you should know that the three point function Liouville theory has an explicit form. Um, and you can take this explicit form. So this three point structure constant, you can write in this way if you want. Um, there, this is uh, in a slightly unusual normalization that is not usually not used in Liouville theory, but that's more convenient for us. Uh, it's some bunch of these uh, special functions that are known as double gamma functions. And this plus minus just means that you take the product of all choices. So this is a product of eight gamma B functions. The explicit form is not very important, but it's important that this formula is known uh, since it will appear uh, later on. And the two point function in this normalization is uh, given by this by a delta function as usual. And there is some non-trivial density in front. Uh, we'll take, so the nice thing about this uh, three point function, if you're familiar with Liouville theory, is that it's invariant understanding any pi to minus pi. So there is no reflection um, amplitude here. I'm just changing the normalization of the vertex operators. And then the two point function will just have one delta function since I can restrict to all my p's being positive. And this row zero that appears here is very natural. Uh, it is this, this product of two cinches, which is uh, in a precise sense, the Plantrell measure on the very zero group. But uh, I don't want to explain what that means uh, in detail, if that's okay. If you know what it means, that's good. Um, but in any case, we'll use this uh, normalization going forward. So now uh, coming to the question uh, about the inner product. So I just told you so far about the uh, Hilbert space as in the vector space. I told you it's spanned by the space of Liouville conformal blocks, but to turn it into a Hilbert space, we need to exhibit an inner product. And this inner product in principle follows from going through this quantization procedure that quantizes Teichmüller space. And um, so if you, you're given two conformal blocks that I'll just call F1 and F2, then what the inner product is, uh, is the complex conjugate of F1 times F2. So this is now, you can think of as being essentially a CFT partition function, except that we just use a single conformal block. So, and usually in CFT, we would sum over many conformal blocks here. So, but it is essentially a CFT partition function of some central charge C. So how are we going to get a number out of it? We need to multiply it with some other factor that in qu geometric quantization is known as Keller potential. Um, that here is played by the by by a speci specific theory, theory, namely time-like Liouville theory of central charge twenty-six minus C, so that this combination transforms like a central charge C um, partition function, and then we can multiply it by the ghost um, partition function, and then integrate over Teichmüller space. So this is just like what we do in string theory, except that it's not. The integrand is not model invariant because we just picked out a single conformal block. And so we need to integrate over all of Teichmüller space to get a sensible expression. So if you think a little bit about it, this is essentially the only thing you can write down as an inner product. And it's very similar to a string theory integral. So you can generalize this also in the presence of punctures. So far, I have mostly talked about uh, surfaces and without punctures. When there are punctures present, uh, it means that in 3D gravity, there's some particle that goes through your initial value surfaces or a black hole, and then you will get the punctured surface. Then this will become a conformal block with external punctures. Then you need to combine this with a correlation function in time like Liouville theory. Um, and you, you'll do essentially everything that you do in string theory usually. And then again, you can integrate this over time a bit. Okay, this is the inner product, but so far this inner product seems pretty useless. So it is an inner product that you can analyze that it converges whenever you have a Liouville, two Liouville conformal blocks here. But um, in order for this to be computationally useful, we'll need some more concrete formula for this inner product. Okay, so let's probably, do that. Uh, probably yep. this, uh, I probably this is a very stupid question. So what's the choice of Q? If Q is arbit B is arbitrary and... Uh, or B is arbitrary, be... you mean this capital Q? Yeah, yeah. Just B. Yeah, this is just B plus B inverse. Uh, but is this an arbitrary parameter in this? Uh... No, it's not. Uh, so, so, so you just—it's just a convention that people usually use in Dilworth theory. You parameterize everything in terms of this B and this combination of B and B inverses denoted by Q. It's not so. There's only one parameter which is B. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is one parameter. You either call it C or B, but uh, there's still the. Uh, what determines the choice because it's uh, it it can be just oh, oh okay good good so central charge 
the central charge is, is uh, arbitrary. It's the ratio of the uh, AD, ADS length divided by Newton's constant, which is a dimensionless constant in 3D. But let me just go back. Oh, that's here. EL by four. Okay, I see. Yeah, okay, that's what you, yeah, okay, I see. Great. Uh, yeah, okay, thanks. Sorry, thank you. Right. And uh, other question. So, Lorenz, uh, yeah. so the integral over the Teichmuller space involves integral over the cross ratio and also the dimensions or what are the coordinates right so if this would be four punctured sphere then this integral is just like an integral over d squared z like usually in string theory hmm. except that the integrand is not single valued so if you take z to say e to the two pi z so you go around the vertex operator then you're not coming back to itself so that means that you need to integrate over the the covering of uh, the z space that you're usually integrating over in string theory I see, I see. Okay. And for, for the torus, maybe it's more familiar. For the torus, usually you integrate over this keyhole region in string yes. theory. Hmm. And now you need to integrate over the full upper half plane. Hmm. Because again, it's not invariant under, say, tau to tau plus one and tau to minus one over tau. I see. This is because the blocks are appearing explicitly. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Thanks. So then another kind of uh, probably some question which I don't understand. So why C cannot be arbitrarily large or can it be? It can be arbitrarily large. Okay. So in, in fact, the... I want it to be at least 25. So if you make C to be very small, then weird things happen. Okay. I see. Yeah. I see. So because I want this B to be real, so that means that Q is at least one, two, which means that C is at least 25. I see. The time like Louisville kind of arbitrary negative uh, central charge. Yeah. So in fact, time like Louisville is only defined if the central charge of this time like Louisville is less equal than one. So that's okay. why also. Yeah. Okay. So, so, yeah, you can. That's why I say it. it's essentially this is the only formula you can write down if you think about it, because you need to combine with some some CFT partition function whose central charge is less equal to one, and it needs mm -hmm. to exist for any any choice of central charge, continuous choice. And the it's yeah. known from bootstrap that the only uh, theory that exists uh, is time like global theory that satisfies this requirement. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, but but really, like all these anomaly con um, con considerations are just like in string theory. Okay, um, so but as already mentioned, there is a sort of better formula for this inner product, or at least more explicit formula, and you can or you can sort of derive it in different ways. None of them are completely rigorous, but um, still pretty convincing, I think. Um, is that if you think about it, what this integral over Teichmuller space is doing, it's doing the BRST reduction that we usually do in string theory. So in string theory, we start with some world sheet theory, and then we're gauging uh, the energy momentum tensor to zero, right? That's the BRST, uh, and then the BRST operator will be some C ghost times the energy momentum tensor plus some, some ghost pieces. And so we're doing this BRST reduction, and that tells us that we need to multiply with the CBZ, and the integral over Teichmuller space is the integral over the zero modes of the ghosts. Um, and if you remember what BRC reduction is doing, it's imposing that all the internal states are physical. So all the internal space, states in particular need to satisfy the mass shell condition. That means if there's some internal uh, state in the conformal block, then it will have some conformal weight, say delta one, uh, and it's combined with the conformal weight of the time like global theory, and it needs to be equal to one. And similarly, in the other conformal block in the F2. So this is like the left moving conformal weight and this is the right moving conformal weight. And you already see that these two conditions impose that delta one will be equal to delta two. And so the only chance is that this inner product is orthogonal. Um, and it imposes that these two conformal blocks are in fact equal. There will be a bunch of delta functions that impose that the internal conformal weights are the same. And so for a three-point function, it's also simple to just evaluate it because for a three-point function, there's no integral to do. So all you are getting is the three-point function of this time-like global theory. And the three-point function of time-like global theory satisfies the sort of amazing equality that it's one over the structure constants of space-like global theory. So you can rewrite your inner product as one over the space-like global theory three-point function. And again, these PIs, they parameterize the conformal weights. Um, they're the global momentum. And you can generalize this, and you can see that uh, in general, if you take the inner product of two conformal uh, blocks that are parameterized by some set of Liouville momenta, then you will get a bunch of delta functions 
that impose that all the internal Liouville momenta are the same. There are three G minus three plus N of those, as many as the modular space has dimensions. And then you get some non-trivial um, density. And this density is basically for, so the conformal block is specified by doing some pair of pants decomposition of your surface. For every pair of pants, you get one uh, structure constants of space like Liouville theory. And for every uh, sort of gluing that you do, you get the two point function rho zero. So this density that appears here is just the inverse of what you would write down in the OP decomposition of Liouville theory. Uh, Lawrence, uh, yep. I have a question on your previous slide again. Uh, previous, uh, so this, this formula that you actually, the one slide before this, yep. uh, so the formula that you write down here is like dressing the Liouville theory with uh, time like Liouville and getting yep. some consistent. Uh, can I replace Liouville with uh, also then if I have arbitrary uh, CFTs? I mean, with, you mean uh, the time 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 lag level? No, 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 not the time lag level part. The Liouville part itself with some other CFTs, I can get a, some consistent uh, definition. Uh, sorry, well, well, there's no. I, I don't know what you mean by Liouville part. You mean the conformal blocks themselves? No, the conformal blocks. Instead of say, I choose some other CFT other than the Liouville CFT, and I want to dress it in such a way that uh, the total. Yeah, but, uh, okay. I make one thing very uh, clear that we're not talking about Liouville theory necessarily. It's just it happens to be so that the, the Hilbert space is the space of Liouville conformal blocks. But I'm there's no uh, so in particular I'm not talking about Liouville theory. So I, I'm just talking about Verizon conformal blocks. So I can't just change. Uh, I could of course try to put in some conformal blocks that don't appear in Liouville theory if that's what you mean. But then this integral would diverge because they're not normalizable. So you can still do some analytic continuation stuff, but uh, the integral doesn't, strictly speaking, converge. So yeah, I, my, I think there's no other choice that you can make. I was just thinking if there's some other uh, other possible definitions which also give consistent uh, with other kind of conformal blocks of other CFTs other than Google. Um, yeah, so you could. So what you can do is to replace this time like global theory. You can try to replace it by say minimum model partition function, which also has central charge less than one. And this works for whenever C has some some special values, and then you can pres presumably get some other formulas. But we haven't explored this. But so there, are, for some special values of C, there are other choices than time like Liouville. But time like Liouville, we know is the correct choice. It follows from the geometric quantization, and it also is the only choice that exists for any value of C. But maybe there are some other kind of exotic theories of gravity out there that use some different inner product. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. All right. How am I doing on time? Since uh, I think in this speed, I probably won't finish, but uh, depends whether people are bothered by this. Um, no, no, it's fine. I mean, we, we okay. usually we go a bit, uh, bit above time. And, like, OK, OK, good. good. Um, all right. So yeah, so this is the inner product, kind of in a more explicit formula. And so there, this was one sort of heuristic derivation. There are others that um, you can see that this inner product is actually uniquely fixed by requiring consistency with crossing transformations, as we'll see now. Um, so let's go to crossing transformations. And that's, I think, maybe related to the question that Ayan asked me in the very beginning. Um, because till now, we haven't really produced anything useful. We'll just exhibit a Hilbert space. And we have some inner product on that Hilbert space. But it's some infinite dimensional Hilbert space. So that still doesn't help us to compute eventually something in this theory. To compute something, we need more structure in the Hilbert space. And uh, the, this additional structure that we have is uh, this set of crossing transformations. So since we can take a crossing, we can take a conformal block. For example, this four uh, punctured sphere conformal block, which I just represented in this way. I hope it's clear what it means. Um, this is a sort of the S-channel conformal block, and we can express it in terms of T-channel conformal blocks. Since conformal blocks are a complete basis of our Hilbert space, nobody told us what uh, pair of pants decomposition of our surface we should use in order to define our conformal blocks. And uh, so this conformal block is some, space, some vector in the Hilbert space, but these conformal blocks are also a complete set of states in the Hilbert space. So this means that I can express this conformal block in terms of linear combination of this conformal blocks. So in other words, there must be some object f that depends on this internal level momentum p21 and p32, as well as in the external weights. 
and um, this is some density and I integrate over this P32 uh, to get this little conformal block. And uh, so this object is known as the Virazoro fusion kernel. And it's sort of amazingly to me, at least, it, this is explicitly known. Um, so while determining conformal blocks explicitly is hard, so it's um, there are just some recursion relations for them or some small small Z expansion or something like this, uh, it is uh, there's an actually closed form formula for this Virazoro fusion kernel. And it's sort of a more complicated version of the DOZZ formula. So it has sort of the same special functions in it, but uh, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, okay, so this is one of these crossing transformations, but uh, we can have more of those. So um, that's why I said, so this F is known in closed form. Uh, if you go to higher genus surfaces, you'll also need uh, other transformations. So for example, the modular transformation of the the conformal block on the once punctured torus. It's known as the modular crossing kernel. Um, so once you have these ingredients, you can uh, define, uh, you, you know how the conformal block on an arbitrary genus surface, arbitrary number of punctures, transforms under all um, modular transformations or crossing transformations. And uh, so we'll have some action of this crossing transformation on our Hilbert space. And all these transformations will be unitary with respect to the inner product. And that's what I mentioned before. It, basically, you can exploit this unitarity to determine what the inner product needs to be. That fixes the inner product uniquely. And um, this uh, sort of abstractly, um, you can summarize this discussion by saying that these um, crossing transformations satisfy the more cyber consistency conditions of rational conformal feed theories. So even though this is not a rational conformal feed theory, uh, the, the set of conformal blocks transforms in a way um, as is appropriate for rational conformal feed theories. So this um, was sort of established in a series of papers, mostly by Teschner, partially of Vartanov, um, that this is indeed the case. And so um, also somewhat abstractly, you can say that um, knowing this Verizoro fusion kernel, as well as the modular kernel, as well as braidings, which are simple, uh, you can define a projective representation of the two-dimensional mapping class group. So the two-dimensional mapping class group is again a fancy name for modular transformations. Because remember, mapping class group means all diffeomorphisms modded out by small diffeomorphisms, which is precisely what modular transformations are doing. And uh, every modular transformations, there is some operator in that Hilbert space that represents it. And together, you'll get a projective representation. So projective again means up to phases is what we usually have in quantum mechanics. Okay, so that's um, the structure of the full Hilbert space. And um, this was uh, part one. <laughs> so uh, let's try to go to part two and uh, see what, uh, and relate it finally to gravity. Okay, so now it's very easy to define this Virazor TQFT. Sorry, just a mathematical question. Uh, yeah. When we do geometric quantization, there is a choice of the quantization given by some choice of a line bundle, right? Sections and some yeah. line. Yeah, so yeah. There are no choices here like this on type. No, there is no choice if the the manifold, the, the phase space is simply yeah. connected. The the uh, the line bundle is uniquely determined. Okay, so here it is. Uh, this Teichmuller space is actually a contractible space, so it's topologically completely trivial. Um, but yeah, you're right that there is a line bundle. It's essentially the line bundle. So the fact that it's a line bundle is related to the fact that uh, conformal blocks are not actually functions on Teichmuller space, but they're uh, because there is a conformal anomaly. So they depend on some explicit choice of trivialization okay. of choice of metric. And so they're not actually functions on Teichmuller space in a canonical way. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Just a small clarification. So, the the uh, the information of the genus of the conformal block that uh, enters as a quantum number in the wave function, or uh, so you get a different. So your Hilbert space will depend on sigma, on yeah. your initial value surface. So it will depend in particular on the genus because oh. for some some different sigma, you'll get the conformal block on some different surface. And the Hilbert space in the end of the day is parameterized by G and by N, as mm -hmm. well as if you have punctures present by the conformal weights of the punctures. This is all the external data that fixes that determines. Yeah. Okay, thanks. All right. Um, so that's this point is related to what was asked before. 
is that we sort of restricted our phase space in a completely arbitrary way and decided to only quantize Teichmüller space because it corresponds to smooth 3D gravity solutions. But nobody told us that this has to lead to something consistent. In fact, if you pick out some other part of the phase space, you don't get something consistent. But uh, the fact that Liouville conform blocks behave nicely under crossing transformations, so in particular they close under cl crossing transformations, which was not completely obvious, means that we have now a nice, uh, we have all the data that we need to define a 3D TQFT. And um, so we'll see that this, this data is in fact sufficient uh, to define a 3D TQFT. This is well known sort of for, um, for the rational case. In this case, it's called a modular functor or a, and defines a modular tensor category. In our case, it's not quite a modular tensor category because it's not a finite Hilbert space. But still, the data will be sufficient to determine the 3D TQFT com completely. This is the TQFT that we'll call the Verizoro TQFT. And sort of the catchphrase that you should uh, remember, perhaps, is that if you know that chern simons theory uh, has a relation to WCW models, the relation is that the Hilbert space of chern simons theory is spanned by the conformal blocks of the WCW model. And here is precisely the same. The Hilbert space of Verizoro TQFT is now spanned by the conformal blocks of the Leovo theory. And so the relation of this Verizor TQFT to Lewa theory is precisely the same as the relation of Chern Simons theory to WCW models. Um, but I'm not saying that they're equivalent or anything. Um, and uh, also, as mentioned already in the beginning, there's there are other constructions of these TQFTs, completely different constructions, uh, and there is known as the Teichmüller TQFT. Um, so these are sort of mathematically more rigorous, but it's very unclear whether the construction that we're giving here is actually the same as there, but we strongly suspect that it is. Okay, so let me mention some of the subtleties. So basically the TQFT doesn't satisfy all the usual axioms, basically because the Hilbert space is infinite dimensional, there are infinitely many uh, liberal conformal blocks, and we don't have a trivial line. So usually we have a bunch of Wilson lines, but here the trivial line is not part of the spectrum of Wilson lines because um, the, the vacuum is not normalizable in Liouville theory. So, or also related to this, the vacuum block is not normalizable. Um, so you can't compute, for example, the, the inner product of the vacuum conformal block with the vacuum conformal block that will diverge. And for this reason, there are various partition functions of the theory that are just not defined and they will diverge. So, for example, if you try to compute uh, the partition functions of this Verizoro TQFT of the three sphere, uh, then it will be just by usual TQFT logic. It's the modular crossing transformation of the vacuum block and to the vacuum block or vacuum just character because it's on the torus to the vacuum character. But this modular transformation is not defined because we only define modular transformations of some, some P1 to P2. And both of these conformal weights needed to be bigger than C minus one over 24. So, and there is no good way to define this S back back. So there's no good definition of three sphere partition function in this theory. Sorry, I, I had um, a quick uh, yep. doubt. So in, in the beginning, you said that uh, in, in the gravity partition function, we have to divide by this mapping plus group in 3D. Yes. So, this you have not done yet, right? This is no, we haven't done it yet. We we just discussed Verizon TQFT so far. Uh, they, we will do that when we relate it to three D gravity, which we'll do very soon. Okay. Yes, yeah, we haven't done that yet. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Thanks for the clarification. Um, and yeah, so for for basically this reason, so that there are some partition functions that that are, are divergent. Um, we can't do everything uh, that we usually do in Chern Simons theory. So usually in transcendent theory, we compute some partition functions using surgery, uh, but sometimes this leads to ill-defined expressions here because, um, yeah, similar to this three-sphere partition function. Uh, one way that you can use to compute a partition function in this bureau zero to QFT is by using Hegar splitting, which is also a well-known technique in transcendent theory. And so that just works. So let me just explain to you the case of a closed manifold. You can generalize it to open manifolds if you want to. Uh, for a closed manifold, you can write any three manifold as a union of uh, two handle bodies. So a handle body is just essentially what is in the figure. It's like the, uh, the interior of a Riemann surface, roughly speaking. And you can use two of these handle bodies and you glue them on the boundary, but you might want to glue them 
by doing and doing a modular transformation. So you might want to first twist them and before you glue them. And it's a theorem uh, that you can produce any closed three manifold in this way. And uh, this presentation makes it very simple to compute the partition function of this variable TQ of T and M. All you need to do is uh, to compute the partition function on the various of the various ingredients. So let's compute first the partition function on the handle body. Uh, it, if you do the path integral on the handle body, as usual, it prepares a state in the boundary surface of the handle body, which is sigma. And um, as in any TQFT, such as Chern-Turner's theory, the state that it prepares is the vacuum conformal block in the in the respective channel that is specified by the handle body. So in this picture, it's just a vacuum block conformal block that you would embed here. So it's like the bubble here and then the line here and the bubble around here. And all the labels are vacuum labels. So now if you have a given a Higard presentation of the manifold, then its partition function will be simply given by this overlap. So the partition function on one uh, handle body is the vacuum block, on the other handle body is also the vacuum block. But then since you glue them together by using some twist, you need to insert this U of phi, where U of phi is, is the unitary presentation, unitary representation of the mapping class group element. So there will be a bunch of products of these Fs and Bs and Ss that we defined before. Bs are braidings, I didn't explain those. Um, but this, these are some explicit expressions here. And in the end of the day, you need to take this inner product uh, here. And you might, of course, immediately complain because here uh, I took a vacuum conformal block and I told you very uh, in a very long-winded way that the vacuum conformal block is not normalizable. But uh, if you take this U of phi and you make phi sufficiently complicated, then U of phi acting on the vacuum block can in fact have a finite inner product with the vacuum block here. So that depends on phi. So in particular, if you take phi to be the identity, then of course it won't work because this U of phi is just also the identity and this inner product is infinite. But if you make phi sufficiently complicated, uh, then this inner product can actually be finite. And this sufficiently complicated means essentially that the 3D manifold, this M, ends up being a hyperbolic manifold. And so this is just the simplest case with closed manifolds. You can pretty easily generalize it to deal also with Wilson lines or boundaries in a similar way. So basically the takeaway is that whenever you do a, uh, some surgery that you do just like in Chun Simon's theory, you should uh, make it in a slightly smart way. And you should in particular cut along some surfaces that are sufficiently hygienous. You should never cut along a sphere boundary because the Hilbert space in the sphere is not particularly well-defined. And so you should ideally just cut once to make it as well-defined as possible. Um, so yeah, since the, I already mentioned most of these things, so the vacuum block is not normalizable, so this inner product may or may not be finite, and uh, our sort of conjecture that works in all the examples that we considered is that uh, the this is a well-defined definition of the partition function that is uh, whenever the manifold turns out to be hyperbolic. So just as a reminder, hyperbolic three manifold means that the metric, uh, the manifold admits some metric uh, that it has constant negative curvature. And sort of most, most 3D manifolds are hyperbolic, just like it's two, most 2D manifolds are hyperbolic. The only exceptions to that are the sphere and the torus in 2D. And similarly in 3D, uh, there's a similar statement. So, okay, so <laughs> let's finally come back to gravity. Sorry for the very long uh, detour. And uh, let's now finally relate this uh, Vero Zorro TQ of T to gravity. So now we know how to compute Vero Zorro TQ of T partition functions. So I hope uh, to have already partially convinced you that this Vero Zorro TQ of T, we can actually compute things. And uh, so now we just need to link it back to 3D gravity. And as was pointed out, the only issue that we didn't fix so far is the mapping class group. Um, and uh, in the gravity path integral to recall, we needed to divide by the full diffeomorphism group, and in particular by the mapping class group when we computed the when we compute the gravity partition function. And so there's a very naive fix of this mismatch of mapping of, of gauge uh, groups, namely to say that the gravity partition function on some manifold M is simply given by the square of the Verozoro TQFT partition function. Because, uh, and this is without boundary, a very important, we'll generalize to the boundary on the next slide. Uh, we'll just compute the Verizor TQFT partition function M, square it, because we have two copies of all these uh, Hilbert spaces, 
And then we need to map mod out by the mapping class group later. And this might seem like a very dumb prescription because in particular, if we would write something like this down in 2D, then the mapping class group would be an infinite group. So I, I shouldn't divide by the order of the mapping class group. That's a very ill-defined um, expression. But in 3D, the situation is, is very different. And it's a, a theorem in 3D that hyperbolic manifolds are rigid, which means that they don't admit any continuous deformations. So contrary in 2D, there's usually some modular space of hyperbolic 2D manifolds. It's a modular space of Freeman surfaces. But in 3D, all these modular spaces are just points. And because of that, you can also show that the mapping class group of any hyperbolic three manifolds are actually uh, finite. And so you're dividing by some finite number here, uh, provided the manifold is hyperbolic. And we also know, or at least suspect, that for hyperbolic manifolds, this very zero TQFT partition function can be defined, for example, by this Hegard splitting. And so this gives you a full definition of what you mean by the gravity partition function. So sorry, uh, Lawrence, about the question about the Heger uh, splitting. Yep. So uh, explicitly at the level of the integrals, which were originally divergent, what is happening now due to the action of the U phi? Good. Um, right. So 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 to define this U phi in the vacuum block, you, you first need um, you can still look at say the vacuum block, and you do some modular transformation of that. That's not a problem, right? And you can re-express it in terms of other conformal blocks that are not the vacuum blocks. So right. the most famous of those, if you do it in the torus, you take the vacuum character on the torus, yeah. you do a conformal trans, you do the modular transformation tau to minus one over tau, yeah. and you can express it in terms of only normalizable characters, with density uh, being the cinch cinch that I showed before. Right. So then, then one can integrate. And then, yeah, and then the inner product becomes finite. Yeah. So basically, then you just need to use this formula for the inner product, this, um, and you can take limits where this piece goes to vacuums, and those limits uh, are finite. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. But I, I should mention that, of course, this very zero to QFT, mathematically at least, it's not uh, as well defined as we would like. <laughs> So there are many uh, kind of, we'll just follow our nose for now. And uh, usually that works, but sometimes one gets into some trouble by doing that. And then, yeah. So some, some more complete treatment is definitely missing. Okay, so this is the no boundary case. And let's uh, come to the more interesting case with boundary. And that was essentially the question that was asked also in the beginning. Um, so with boundary, we have various uh, mapping that we first need to be sure how we define our mapping class group. So the, map, but the bulk mapping class group, this M delta M, um, is the, uh, we can, with the delta M, we can identify with the, so this is defined to be the group of all diffeomorphisms on M that can act non-trivially on the boundary. And we mod that by the small diffeomorphisms again. So in particular, the, the, the example that I mentioned already before for the solid uh, cylinder, a solid torus, a, a part of this, this mapping class group will be just cut uh, Z and it's the generator is given by cutting open the torus and twisting it and regluing it. Um, and uh, so you see that whenever you do something like this, uh, you also induce a map on the boundary because I cut it open and, and I twisted it, which is a DIN twist on the boundary. And so you have always a natural map from the bulk mapping class group to the boundary mapping class group. And again, there is a very deep theorem that is uh, very difficult to prove in the math literature. So this map actually has no kernel whenever M is hyperbolic. So you can view the bulk mapping class group as being a subgroup of the boundary mapping class group. And so you can naturally form this coset. So, so the proposal now is that if you compute the gravity partition function on some fixed topology, then this, this uh, computation should include a sum over the boundary mapping class group, which is like the sum over, say, some ADS, BTZ black holes, and the different spinning black holes. But in order not to overcount, we should mod out by the mapping class group of the bulk, since those describe equivalent uh, topologies. So we get this coset, and we can naturally identify this as a subgroup of this. And then we take, the again, the Verizor TQFT partition function on this manifold, and it's sort of acted on with this gamma. So by which I mean, it's the kind of twisted one. So for gamma equal to one, say this is thermal ADS, for gamma equal to minus one over tau, for the solid torus, this is BTZ black hole and so forth. And so we get this infinite sum. 
I'll, I won't say anything about the convergence of this infinite sum, which is a whole different issue. Okay, so that's the proposal. Um, maybe I should ask for questions and um, then I'm officially over time, but uh, I think that the applications will be quite short, so shouldn't be too bad. Okay. So is the claim that this matches the the gravity partition functions written earlier in the literature? Yes, uh, it will reproduce all 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 the things that have been written earlier in the literature. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we'll see some examples. In particular, the most famous is this Maloney Witten, and it's basically trivial. It will be trivial to reproduce Maloney Witten. Okay. Let's see Maloney Witten since it's my first example. So. Um, We'll start with, uh, so our manifold will be a solid torus. Uh, so it's thermal ADS. And the uh, Verizoro, sorry, it should have been Verizoro partition function on the solid torus is just a vacuum block on the torus. That's a special case of what we saw before, where we evaluated partition function on handle bodies. The solid torus is a special case of the handle body. And the vacuum block on the torus is uh, just a fancy name for the vacuum Verizoro character. And so now uh, we just need to work out all these things in the sum. So the mapping class group of M is PSL to Z. The mapping class group of uh, the bulk mapping class group is Z, uh, which is again given by um, cutting open along a disk and twisting. And so at the end of the day, the sum over uh, this coset runs over PSL to Z mod Z, which is the same sum that uh, Maloney and Witten have when they computed their thermal ADS uh, three partition function. And you can parameterize it by a pair of co-prime integers if you want. So this is the sum over C and D in Z and the, their co-prime. And then you take the vacuum character and act on it with the modular transformation. Um, so, and you get this formula. And A and B are determined such that AB, AD minus BC is one. And you see like uh, maybe also explicitly here, this mapping, the bulk mapping class group, the C, on the boundary, it corresponds to sending tau to tau plus one. And you see indeed that the vacuum character is invariant under tau to tau plus one, or at least up to a phase, which cancels out once you take absolute value square. And so you should have really summed over this. You, you need to absolutely gauge by the mapping class group in the bulk, since otherwise the, the formula wouldn't diverge. OK, so that's the, the um, simplest result. And maybe to, to to another simple result that was only partially known in literature is um, we can discuss the Euclidean wormhole. So Euclidean wormhole is the has topology some Riemann surface sigma that will take to be some hyperbolic Riemann surface times the real line. Um, so it, it yeah it has two boundaries, namely for real for this parameter to minus infinity and to plus infinity. And uh, if you take the the moduli of the surface at the two boundaries to be the same. Then this manifold has a simple hyperbolic metric. So this is uh, was first written down by Madison and Maus, um, and it's sort of the the analog of the wormhole that is usually discussed in two D. So it's uh, it is quite important for applications, um, many recent applications. Okay, um, but uh, it's completely trivial now to determine the gravity partition functions on on this topology. So we just go through our uh, procedure. So we first need to determine the Verizoro TQFT partition function on this topology, and then we'll put it together and determine the 3D gravity partition function. So from a TQFT perspective, the sigma times R is basically not doing anything because uh, let's say we have some complicated 3D manifold. We cut it open along some Riemann surface somewhere, and we glue in this Euclidean wormhole, and we re-glue back. Then uh, we haven't changed the topology of the surface, which means that the partition function on sigma times r in some appropriate sense needs to be the identity. And what the, the appropriate sense means is that sigma times r has two boundaries, the left boundary and the right boundary. We have a Hilbert space on the left and a Hilbert space on the right. And we can view the partition function the sigma times r as being a map from the left boundary to the right boundary from those two Hilbert spaces. That map needs to be the identity because uh, if we glue it somewhere in, then we don't change anything. And so in some appropriate sense, this Verizoro TQFT partition function is the identity. More concretely, what that means is uh, we know that the Hilbert space of Verizoro TQFT is spanned by conformal blocks. 
So what we'll do is just to write down a complete resolution of the identity. So we'll sum over all conformal blocks, or the sum will be really an integral uh, on the Riemann surface. We'll write uh, f of sigma, which we associate to the left boundary, f sigma bar, which we'll associate to the right boundary. And then we need to divide out by the norm because we already know that they're all orthonormal. So we can write it in this simple form, or orthogonal. Okay, so that's the Verizor T of T partition function. You don't essentially have to do anything. Uh, and now if you recall the explicit form of this inner product, the inner product was basically just a bunch of delta function and it was one over the OPE density of Liouville theory. And so if you look again at this formula, this is one over the OPE density of Liouville theory. This is the left moving conformal block, the right moving conformal block, and this is an integral over all conformal blocks. And so what's written is precisely the conformal block decomposition of a partition function or correlation function in Liouville theory. So what we'll see, uh, what we get is that the Virazor TQFT uh, partition function is just Liouville partition function or correlation function, depending on whether we put punctures. Um, and so we should also mention that in this application, the moduli on the two sides of the wormhole can in principle be different. There is no reason why they should be the same. And so in this case, you would get the Liouville correlation function whose left moving moduli are independent from the right moving moduli. So you, you analytically continue away from sort of the real slice that we usually have in CFT. So that's the answer for Virazor TQFT. And to get the full gravity answer, all we need to do is to sum over um, the mapping class group in an appropriate way. So in our case, uh, in, for this topology, the boundary mapping class group, we have two boundaries. So the boundary mapping class group will be just the direct product of the mapping class group of a Riemann surface times the mapping class group of a Riemann surface. And the bulk mapping class group is a single, the single diagonal copy because the bulk mapping, the bulk topology is sigma times R. So if you do a mapping class group transformation on that, you're just doing it simultaneously on both sides. And so what this coset runs over is the is MCG times MCG divided by the diagonal MCG. And so in the end of the day, that means you only need to sum over, say, the left or the right mapping class group. So the final answer for the gravity partition function on this Euclidean wormhole is a big sum over the mapping class group of a uh, single Riemann surface. And um, then you act on the right movers here and the left movers you keep intact. And indeed, if you take the liberal partition function, you would act both on the left and the right movers, then it would be invariant. So that's why you shouldn't overcount the sum. And uh, similar formulas for special cases have appeared before in the literature, maybe most uh, well known as the one by Kotlin Jensen, who computed this for sigma being the torus. Um, uh, for the torus, this formula becomes a little bit, breaks down a little bit because um, for the torus, sigma is actually not hyperbolic. And so you need some dual partition function on the torus, which is a little bit subtle. But modulo the subtleties essentially it matches with what they said. Um, and also it was already computed by three punctured sphere and so very special cases. But it's very simple to get this answer out of this formalism. So sorry, uh, Lawrence, did you say yeah. that uh, in principle, the two uh, the two data can be different, uh, the sigma left? Yes, sigma. that's right, yeah. So this is known as a quasi-Fuxian wormhole if the left yes. moduli are different from the right module. And, and and there were results of that also, or this is a new result uh, from this? Uh, no, this is new, this is new. I see. Yeah, the pro for this quasi fuxian wormhole, it's not even known what the classical metric is. So you can't even write down the classical solution. It's known that it exists. <laughs> it's mathematically proven that there is a solution. But uh, so it's very hard to try to write down a classical solution and compute the on shell action and maybe compute some one loop determinant or something. But, but it's essentially tri trivial to do this. But that is also going to be by construction invariant under independent uh, models. Yes, yes, it is. Yeah. And it can be explicitly written, written, written down in some uh, um, limit. Uh, yeah, you can try to take, say, the limit where b goes to zero or something like that. Uh, so this, the central charge goes to infinity, and then you you reproduce the same classical expansion. Uh, but of course, it's not completed, uh, as you know very well. Like if you take conform, so yeah. it is in some sense explicit. But of course, you still need to know what the conformal blocks are. So in conformal blocks are still pretty complicated beasts. Yes. Uh, if you take c to infinity, then there will be some semi-classical exponentiation, which then you can identify with the 
on-shell action on the solution. But it's still uh, somewhat difficult to do that uh, explicitly. Okay, thanks. Um, right. Good. Yeah, and also in uh, conformal blocks, always have a conformal anomaly. The conformal anomaly represents uh, in, if you do, would do the semi-classical gravity computation, you will need to do holographic renormalization. So you need to put some cutoff surface and you need to renormalize the volume. And there's an ambiguity in doing that, which is reflected by the conformal anomaly of the partition function. That, that's just like an, always an idea CFT. It's not anything new. All right. Um, good. So this is my last example, and then I'll be done. Um, so just to see something uh, more non-trivial to convince you that uh, perhaps this works more in general is uh, let's look at this uh, topology. So what this means is you look at uh, the three sphere and you remove four uh, balls and um, you look at the complement. So, and then you, uh, every ball will have one puncture on its uh, surface and you connect it to one other ball in this. And uh, overall this gives some tetrahedral sh shape so that the corners of the tetrahedron are the four balls and the edges are, the, are these six Wilson lines. And uh, this topology is somewhat interesting because it's sort of the leading uh, leading topology that contributes to the non-Gaussianities of this uh, boundary ensemble dual of 3D gravity. So there's a pretty explicit proposal for this um, ensemble by, in this paper. And if you would push it beyond the Gaussian level, uh, the non leading non-Gaussianities of the three-point functions are controlled by this topology. And so that topology is also nice because they made a prediction from this ensemble CFT uh, perspective what the 3D gravity partition function should be on this topology. So we know the answer, but till now there was no way to compute this answer from 3D gravity directly. So let's compute it. And it's very simple to do. All you need to do is you need to apply Higard splitting. So let's do that. Uh, so we need to present our manifold in uh, as an overlap of two handle bodies. So it won't be quite handle bodies because there are uh, Wilson lines in there, but it's simple to deal with it. So uh, what we do is we cut the manifold along this uh, vertical slice, and we'll look at the left part and the right part. And both the left and the right part are just uh, have this form. So there are like two balls removed, and then there, there's a boundary, and the Wilson lines are going like this. But if you look at the picture, the, the left part and the right part are sort of twisted with respect to each other. One has the, uh, is sort of in the S channel, the other one is in the T channel. But you can think of this topology as being the result of gluing the boundary of this to the boundary of this. And uh, so it's sort of the overlap of the S channel conformal block with the T channel conformal block. Okay, so, but this overlap is simple to determine. All you need to do is you need to do a, a crossing transformation on say this S channel conformal block and express it in terms of T channel conformal blocks that will give you this versor fusion kernel. And then you can take the inner product, which then is simple. It's just again, this one over C zeros, the simple form. And so if you do all of this, uh, you see that this versor TQFT partition function, the four boundary wormhole is essentially just this, um, Versor uh, fusion kernel F here. And you'll get a bunch of C zeros from taking inner products and so forth. Um, and you can also check that this, this full combination uh, has indeed tetrahedral symmetry. So it has the full symmetry that is expected from the picture. But at least in the intermediate steps of the computation, that symmetry wasn't present because we cut the picture uh, in half. And so it's a somewhat non trivial check of the computation. And of course, also this result matches with the prediction that was given in this paper uh, of this random CFT proposal. So uh, it's a non-trivial check. But, uh, and yeah, all of these um, things here are pretty explicit functions. Um, and also in this case, there's no, um, there's no mapping class groups whatsoever. So uh, the gravity result is just the absolute value squared of this result. Okay, um, so that's it. Um, I just have some small additional comments. So um, you can, if you're more mathematically inclined, you can also think of 3D gravity partition functions as topological invariants of these uh, three manifolds. So you can compute the 3D gravity partition functions um, 
on these manifolds. They're in principle similar to standard transcendence uh, invariants. And so in particular, a huge class of such uh, inver manifolds is given by not complements. So that's what mathematicians like to look at. They like to put some not in a uh, some three sphere, say, and look at the complement. And for many knots, this the re relevant manifold has a hyperbolic structure, such as the figure eight knot that boromine brings and many more. And then uh, there was also a question before, if we take the semi-classical limit, meaning that c goes to infinity, then in principle, this, these types of computations should recover the, um, the gravity, the semi-classical gravity expansion. So the leading term gives you just the on-shell action of gravity, the subleading term gives you the one-loop determinant and so forth. So in particular, that gives you a kind of a cool way to compute these on-shell actions from that perspective and also the one-loop determinants, which are pretty non-trivial to compute on its own. Okay, so let me just summarize uh, the main important points. So what we'll, we have done is to give, uh, if you want, the definition of the 3D gravity partition functions in terms of the Verzorti Q of T. And the Verzorti Q of T admits a computationally useful description. And uh, in particular, this relation trivializes many of the computations that have been done in the literature uh, by many different techniques and often quite laboriously. Um, so the prescription for now works for all hyperbolic three manifolds. The main reason for this is on the one hand that this Verzorti Q of T sometimes has divergent partition function, and also the mapping class groups can be infinite for non-hyperbolic three manifolds. And then we don't really know how to deal with them uh, in general. And uh, so hopefully in the future, uh, this technology will be useful in uh, determining what the CFT dual is of 3D gravity or whether 3D gravity actually makes sense at a quantum level. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for this wonderful talk. Uh, so now it's time to take some questions. Uh, okay, maybe uh, let me begin with a question. So in 2D gravity, there are this uh, basis of states where you have this so-called fixed area state. Is Your connection is cutting out for me at least. Log um, of this, like, and uh, so when people have quantized uh, JT gravity, for example, the states and um, and uh, so is there some kind of okay? Uh, so my question is, uh, uh, in two D gravity, people have defined some. Uh, is my kind of connection good now? Hello. Yeah, it's better now. Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, so uh, 2D gravity, people have defined this basis of states called fixed area states yeah. and uh, uh, and written operators in such basis. And uh, is there some analog of it in 3D gravity? Um, yeah, good question. I, I don't know of any natural analog, at least in this framework. Um, so it's there's there are, I think, good analogs in, in the... Um, in the context of classical or semi-classical descriptions, but uh, in this T Q of T, it's not very it doesn't seem very natural to me to fix the area or fix the the volume. Um, yeah, but I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Could I ask another question? If you don't mind. Yes, please. Thank you for the nice talk. Uh, so, given the problems with the maloney witten description of three D gravity, do you think you could use your approach to maybe modify the partition function in any way? Is there any freedom to glue left and right differently and so on to, to maybe see if you can get positive spectral densities and all these other issues? Yeah, right. Um, so I unfortunately have not many new things to say about this. Uh, so, so I kind of sympathize with the attempts in the literature that we're trying to incorporate off-shell partition functions in order to fix that. Right. Um, but yeah, so the problem is that they're off shell. So if they're off shell, they're no longer hyperbolic. So okay. this uh, this technology doesn't really apply. So it has not really many new things to say about uh, this kind of problem, which also is, is kind of an exponentially small problem, which I'm not sure whether it's important. Yeah, it's probably important, but it's uh, it can be cured by putting a little correct. And yeah, but... Yeah, but my other question was, can, can I glue left and right 
differently or is it always going to be mod square is there any it's freedom al it's always going to be mod square mod there's square. no at least if you start with standard uh gravity so you can you can choose for example what ian was asking if i understood his question correctly so you can choose uh to modify say the inner product here i say when the center charge is something special you could put a, some minimal model or some other cft here and then this inner product is no longer ne necessarily orthogonal and then you would glue left and right moves differently so there can be this kind of more exotic theories of gravity that only exist for central charge, some special central charges, and those uh, might have different viewings of left and right movers, but in gener generically, no. Okay. Thank you. Okay, maybe I can continue on what I was asking. So one very really interesting question is to see whether what aspects of semi-classical gravity we can recover here and in a more yeah. detail. Uh, so as you are saying that it's not very natural to ask whether for like this fixed volume states and all this, uh, but um, do you think that uh, is it uh, like you can go to the semi-classical uh, limit and see if this is a normalizable or a non-normalizable state, we think of fixing the volume, for example. Or yeah, I mean, you can definitely go to semi-classical limits, and so there is a pretty precise, so if you compute, say, some, some partition function on some manifold, then and you expand it semi-classically, first of all, the prediction is that it needs to be exponential, it needs to exponentiate, so because we know in, in the semi-classical gravity, the, uh, like, the central charge is related to 1 over G Newton, right? And so the, the tree level comes with one over G Newton, the one loop is order one, the higher loops are G Newton proportional. So there is an expansion of, if you take a partition function, you take the logarithm of it, then there needs to be an expansion in one over C and the leading term is of order C. So, and the, in particular, the leading term reproduces the volume, the subleading term, the one loop determinant and so forth. And uh, so in, we check that for, for some simple examples, but it's pretty hard to check that non, uh, in general. That this this uh, is true, but there's you can make the direct con connection to semi-classical computations. I'm not sure I answered your question, but <laughs> so I was thinking more in the context of uh, uh, like the general semi-classical gravity uh, type computations, where uh, for example you take fixed area states and do it in some some way. There are ways to do it, right? So those kind of computations yeah. right, uh, where what happens and whether that uh, becomes uh, nonsense because is that these are non normalizable states or things like that yeah what uh, or how to recover semi classical operators or things like that and uh, yeah you so, can reproduce all you can recover all the semi classical operators and like the length uh, and volume are, for example a semi classical like you said that one is this uh, volume would be a semi classical operator yeah yeah you can also i mean one thing that i haven't discussed very much is like if you put if you put wilson lines uh i haven't told you very much about what wilson lines mean but wilson lines in this tqft perspective is basically you can associate some conform weight to them and if you if you go above the threshold then they become black holes that propagate along the wilson lines and if they're below the threshold then they're just some massive particles but they create a conical defect from the point of view of 3d gravity so that, that's what Wilson lines mean. So, so all of those you can you can take semi-classical limits and reproduce those, and have the area operators uh, around, uh, say that measure the black hole horizon and things like that. Um, yeah, we haven't explored that too much, but that in principle all these operators are there. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, if not, then uh, okay. we close the recording now.